Hey, it's time for voiceover body shop and bore you in for a treat tonight because George isn't here. Our original guest broke two ribs, so he couldn't be here. But we have David H. Lawrence with us tonight, who is going to act as co-host. What? Yeah. I didn't wait. Uh, really? Yes. I get to do that? Yeah, you do. Fantastic. All right. All right. If you've got a question for David about acting, voice acting, or just voiceover work, or any of the things that we're going to talk about, throw them in the chat room. I know that our good friend Jeff Holman is sitting there, wherever it is that he watches the show from, and will relay those questions to us. He's writing it down with a quill pen. Yeah. And somehow it ends up over here. And uh, so stay tuned. We're going to talk about voice acting, which is what we're all supposed to be doing anyway. Right here on VoiceOver Body Shop, right now. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan's signature products. Source Elements, the folks who bring you Source Connect, JMC Demos, when quality matters. VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your voice actor website shouldn't be a pain in the butt. VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for voiceover success. And by World Voices, the industry association of freelance voice talent. And now, here's your hosts, Dan and George. So I, I have to play George? No, no, you can be yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm Dan Leonard. <laughs> I'm David Lawrence. <laughs> David and, H. Lawrence the 17th. What the, hell's is, my, what the hell's my name? I don't know. I, I've, I almost forgot, too. This is VoiceOver Body, Body Shop, Shop, or V-O-B-S. You've been watching a while. How did I do that? You've been watch, we've been doing this for 11 All years. Right, that's, fine. That's how All you right. figured it out. Uh, well, uh, we didn't even rehearse that. Yeah. We don't need no stinking rehearsals. No, we don't need that. All right. Cool. Yeah. Uh, but anyway... Um, See, originally, you know, George wrote me last week, said, I have to go to England. I have to go to England. He had to go to England. Have to go to England. He All right. to go to England. Yeah, for right. whatever reason. And uh, I guess he's spending some time with family in England or his girlfriend's family or something like that. He didn't go for the food? Uh, no one goes to England for the food. All right. If you say so. From, from my understanding. Yes. Uh, and then <laughs> um, we we had Scott Parkin originally scheduled for tonight. We were yeah. going to have a great time doing improv with him. But he unfortunately got hit by the rudder of his surfboard yesterday and apparently broke two ribs. Oh, likely excuse. So that's from what I understand. Wow. So he had to cancel out. And so our good friend David H. Lawrence the 17th was more than happy to come in and co-host with me tonight so we can talk about more voice acting stuff. Yeah. So Dan thinks he jujitsued me. He think he said, well, I would have asked you, but it's the last minute. I don't know if you're available. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, sure, I'd be happy to. I actually wasn't doing anything this afternoon. Wow. Well, so my, the, we all we all benefit nice. from that. that. That's great. I was going to go surfing, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I Scott owes me a surfing lesson. I won a surfing lesson from him a couple of years ago. He goes, so what are we going to do the surfing lesson? I'm like, there's sharks out there. I'm not, I'm not going out there. <laughs> so then he goes and he breaks two ribs, and I'm like, maybe I shouldn't be taking surfing lessons. <laughs> you just ruined the whole thing for him. I, I know. All right. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, but then, then it got better. Then our director, Sue Merlino, who usually directs our show, came down with COVID. She's like, I, I should be able to do it. But no, she's like really sick. I'm like, mm. you know. Drink plenty of fluids, Tylenol, stay horizontal. Right. Don't go near voiceover body shop tonight, and we'll be fine. So <sighs> we're doing the show live, and I'm directing it. And I gotta be I gotta be honest, I'm really impressed with how you're able to actually run this. You know, it used to be called combo when we worked in radio, <laughs> right? Right. You're right. running this combo. And that's pretty cool, especially since it's video. I know. Yeah. See, we, we originally were just going to do a podcast when George and I first started, decided to do this. Yeah. 
And he's like, well, we got webcams, so why don't we do it as a webcast? Oh, that was the bad suggestion it, on it, his part. It, it was yeah. originally. And yeah. then, um, you know, we're like, well, well, how do we do that? Well, there weren't a lot of streaming networks in 2011. We had to figure out how to do it ourselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and paid to the nose for it for a while. And then, um, you know, and then things got better. Yeah. And the technology got better. And yeah. we got better. If you ever go back and watch episode number one. I wouldn't go that far. But it's fun to watch. <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah. But our, our guest host tonight is the one and only David H. Lawrence, the seven. So am I a guest host or am I a co-host? You're, you're a guest co-host. Guest co-host. All right. Best of both worlds. All so, right. Sort of so. like in the old Mike Douglas show. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to be Arthur Treacher for Merv Griffin. <laughs> but will you do the Virginia Reel? Uh, no. Okay. No. And I won't play. What was the name of the woman that was always in the audience? Mrs. Somebody? Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller. Uh, hello, Mrs. Miller. How are you? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And uh, we've just lost everyone under the age of 58. What? They're gone. What, what, what are they talking about? Oh, my God. Let's talk about voice acting. Because you're a voice actor. I'm a voice actor. Yeah. But you're also an accomplished screen actor. I mean... We've seen you in Heroes, where you were the legendary puppet master, mm -hmm. uh, where you got to work with Hayden... What's Hayden Panettiere, Panettiere, Zachary Quinto, uh, Milo Ventimiglia. Yeah, yeah, all these, all these low-level stars. Yeah, the people that someday I think they're going to make it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How did, how did you get that particular role? That's a great question. I'm asking that That's question. a question that demands a complete and thorough answer, one that provides the person asking the question with a feeling of being taken care of and being uh, serviced. So I'm, I'm hoping that that happens for you at some point. <laughs> no, I, I, have, I have absolutely no idea other than it is incredibly indicative of exactly what our business is all about. Uh, we have no control over what happens once we do our audition. We have no control over what happens. And I remember uh, the, the audition that I, I did for that was on the, the grounds of the Universal Studios. Have you heard of them? Oh, yeah. I've been there. Yeah. So I'm in the casting office uh, for Heroes, which is on Universal lot. And I go in. I walk in. And... They have this big, huge waiting area with like 20, 25 chairs all in a big circle just outside the door of where we're auditioning. And I had never felt so small in my life because every other chair in this room was filled and it was filled with an actor that had scared the living crap out of me at some point. How so? Just I recognized them oh, okay. as being You're intimidated by the fact. That yeah, and I'm like, actors, why but... am I here? Who made the mistake of inviting me to this party? You know, and I, I actually did something that my friend Michael Kostroff taught me, which was to sit in such a way, if you can, where you can see into the casting room when they open the door, just to get an idea of what you're going to encounter when you walk in there. And I was seeing that there were lots of people inside the casting room. You know, usually there's one, two, maybe three. Maybe there's a writer in there. There were 11 people in the room. Like they had, you know, stadium seating going this, on. This is in the casting room. In the casting. Where you're actually in there when they're filming you. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and I watched and I, I was like, I'd signed in and I was like 30th on the list or so. Who knows? But I'm watching people walk into that room where they're going to do the work. And being struck by the number of people in the room and, and like you can see them visibly reacting to it. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so when I walked into the room, I said, wow, look at this. Look at you guys all showing up for my audition. Thank you. And it just broke the tension in the room. I didn't have to worry about it. I did my first take. And apparently it was the director that stood up and did this. I remember because he told me about this, the rap party. He goes, yeah, you were doing great, but you were too far away. The, the microphone was on their camera, and we couldn't hear very well what you were doing. I could hear you in the room, but I wanted to make sure we could see it on tape. So he had me pull my chair right up to the camera and do it exactly the same. Don't change a thing. One more time. And I remember at the point when I got my creepiest, I noticed just off camera there was a woman who turned out to be the head of casting for NBC who shuddered. And I'm like, 
okay, either it's cold in here or maybe I did something good there. <laughs> and this was late morning on a Thursday. I went home, took a nap because that's what I do. And I was awakened by my agent at about 2.30 who said, you should call your kids because you're going to be on Heroes. And that's how that happened. And I'm like, you're out of your mind. You're out of your ever loving mind. So yeah. I don't know how it happened. I just had fun with it. You, cre I, you creeped them out successfully. I creeped them out. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a creepy character. He was creepy. And he got creepier as it went on. Right. You know, it was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. I, re I really enjoyed that. Character. That's great. Well, I enjoyed that show too. It was, yeah. It was, it was kind of a new type of thing that they. Oh, did. my God. I was a fan from the very first moment when Claire fell off the scaffolding and then put herself back together. <laughs> right. And I was like, what is this? How did they do that? You know, I didn't know about Final Cut Pro. What did I know? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> It, it, it was it was it was a great show, but but let's talk a little bit about about acting itself because you know the people forget that voice acting is acting. Yeah, I mean a lot of people just think, well, I just read for a living. It, it's not that you've you've got to become somebody else. Yeah, it's interesting how people will uh, clearly understand that acting on stage and acting on camera are very, very similar. There's just some adjustments that you make based on what I call the collector device. Right. You know, is it a camera? Is it a live audience? And that gets extended into voiceover as well. And going back to the, 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 the Heroes um, audition, I asked them as I was about to do my audition, how tight of a shot do you have on me? And they said, hey, you know, head and shoulders. And I'm like, oh, this is great because I'm going to drop my voice down here. And it was, it, you know, we tend to, as voice talent, be much more aware of vocal distancing than people who are just getting started in on-camera work and certainly stage work. But the people that do really well in on-camera work, they get the whole notion of the bigger the shot, the louder you can be, right. the smaller the shot, the softer you should be. And that spills over into voiceover as well when you start to think about who are you talking to? What are you trying to help them do? You know, do you need to put on the superhero armor of being a professional voice talent? And, you know, I, I, I see my clients sometimes, I see people that I, I coach making the mistake of thinking that Unless they become a better version of themselves right away, nobody's going to pay them, right? Why would I use the voice that I wake up with in the morning in any way, shape, or form? You know, if the line is, I don't know, they're going to elocute that. They're going to enunciate that. I don't know. Or, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that, does that work for the script? Right. Maybe you should consider that, just like you would with any other form of acting. So I think we forget that the acting part, oh, that's the acting part. Right. I see. Not the recording at minus 12 to minus 60 B, occasionally peaking in the red. Forget about that. Story. Yeah, you yeah. think about those things much more often, it, f it feels like anyway, than you think about what your job is in the script, what the words are asking you to do. And once you do realize that, and you kind of get your tech into auto mode, you know, you know how far away you need to lean from the mic if you're going to raise your voice or whatever you're going to do. Or if you're running a compressor, you know, you, you can rely on that. Um, but, but I think that the, the notion of acting is lost because people think, commercials? You act in commercials? Yeah, you do. You act in commercials. And you certainly act with audiobooks. You even act with IVR. You act informative, but you still are acting. You're, you're helping somebody get their job. They want to know how close they are to the limit on their credit card as they're standing in line at Target with a cart full of stuff. And your job as an IVR person is to make sure they understand that they've got $58 in room on their card and that's it. So <laughs> you, you, it's still acting. Right. 
Yeah. It, oh, and then and you thought I was not going to have much to say. Oh no, that's why you're here. I, I see. All right, fine. All right, plenty great. Plenty to say. If great. you're just joining us, our guest tonight is David H. Lawrence, the seventeenth. We're talking about voice acting, which, by the way, Voice Over Body Shop is about. In case you've been wondering over the yeah. last few years about that. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a question for David, and I'm sure you have probably plenty. Throw them in the chat room, whether you're watching on Facebook Live, whether you're watching on YouTube, whether you are watching off, you know, some satellite somewhere, you know, some, you know, some satellite from SpaceX and it's beaming it down to you. Yep. Put it in the chat room wherever you are, and that question will get relayed to us, and we will ask David that question in the next segment of our show. I hear that Starlink makes us both sound so cool, so awesome. Yeah, I want to try Starlink. Have you tried, have you looked at? Uh, I may have. Okay. I may have. Um, it's kind of half baked at this point. It's going to get better. It, it's going to get better. You kind of have to have you know direct line of sight, you know. But you know, it's kind of like the the first parts of when five G was kind of available, mm -hmm. you know, because five G isn't five G. Five G is whatever people want to call five G. It, right. it appears. Um, I want to make sure that people uh, really, like, smash the like button. I want the like button on your computer to be unrecognizable <laughs> when you're finished liking what we're doing and sharing with the other social media members that you happen to know. If you would do that for me, I'd appreciate it. All righty. David A. Lawrence is our guest. So... How did you get into acting? Because you and I started in radio, I think. Yeah. And, but uh, which was acting. Yeah, it's acting. You know, it's a it's good like, form hey, of acting. Minutes after the hour. And, yeah, it's a little pukey in yeah. terms of acting, but yeah, you know. In fact, it got me fired. That pukey. Really? They, oh my god! They wanted you to be more no. natural. They wanted no. you to be more pukey. No. No. What did they want? All I could do when I first started doing radio was be my heroes. Imitate my heroes. Who were? Uh, the real Bob James, John Lanigan, Don Imus. Don Imus yeah. uh, and Don Imus didn't puke. Don Imus just, just, he was just, just very forward. He was movies. mumbling when he was at WGAR in Cleveland. He was like, how are you right, doing right, this right, morning? Because right. I was an overnight guy, and I would like make sure that his stuff was prepped for the first half hour and mm -hmm. sometimes run it for him because he would get in when he decided to get in. Right. Anyway, um... I could not do anything but that really back of the throat kind of thing that I thought was going to get me uh, hired in the big markets. And I was in Columbus, Ohio. And it was 1978, August of 1978. For those of you that are Catholic, you might remember we lost a pope that, that month, Pope John Paul I. And he was the guy that was in the pope's office for about 30 days, 30, 31 days. And he really affected me, you know? little Jew boy from, from Cleveland, Ohio. But here's this Pope who on St. Peter's Square asks a, a an altar boy to come over and sit next to him so that he can talk to him about honoring your mother and father. And I thought to myself, as I'm watching in Columbus, Ohio, when they're showing, you know, tape of this on, on the CBS Evening News, I'm thinking, that kid is going to go to his village or neighborhood in Rome or whatever. And he is going to be pre-sainted. Like he touched the Pope. The Pope talked to him. He's special, right? And, you know, Popes were very like hands off before that. You know, they were very like detached. Right. So he had affected me. He passed away on a Thursday. I had a Saturday midday show. It's really <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> I had a Saturday midday show, and at the time, on our playlist was a song by Billy Joel that I dedicated to the memory of Pope John Paul I. And I, I dedicated it just like this. Going out to Pope John Paul I, he died too young for us. <laughs> Billy Joel, only the good die young. WNCI. Okay. Fast forward about 48 oh, hours. <laughs> Those of you that know the lyrics to the song, you're already ahead of me. 48 hours, I get a phone call at 7.30 in the morning on Monday morning from my program director who says to me, <laughs> Mike Metzger, says to me, uh, yeah, hey, man, um, could you come down to the station? Because we're changing the locks and we got to like get everybody's keys and give out new ones. What he didn't say was, you're not getting a new one. 
you're being fired. Because I had to walk past these protesters right. who I had I had no idea what they were protesting. You know, they were protesting me. And they were pro- and they and and the thing was that that WNCI knew that only the good die young was on the Catholic diocese do not playlist, and they were like, don't listen to that station because they're playing the devil's music apparently. So and I just made it worse, and it was partly because of the way I presented myself. It was almost like a joke, and it wasn't. I really felt that. But you, you never know who's listening exactly. when you're on the radio exactly. or when you're doing anything for that. So yeah. acting for me didn't really play into it until much later in my career when I started doing talk radio. Because within 15 minutes of starting a talk show, yeah. unless you're Rush Limbaugh, you drop the whole DJ thing. Right. You just talk with people, right? right? You're just talking. And uh, when I decided I wanted to be... An on-camera actor, it was some really crazy, like, uh, uh, you know, brain-eating worm that got up into my head and th- made me think that with this amazing face and this gorgeous physique that I could possibly add on-camera work to my my Your my repertoire. quiver yeah yeah you know and part of it was the weather in washington dc i wanted to get as far away from it as possible and i thought all right fine i'm gonna try this and i was 49 years old or 40 46 years old and i got my first gig when i was 50 and that was heroes really? so here we go back to heroes again wow. would you like me to tell you more about all this no that's okay no that's but, fine but you but you got into <laughs> acting and uh, yeah yeah, yeah. But, the only acting i had done before that was when some organization in washington dc or new york or wherever i was working in radio wanted me to promote their thing on my show so they'd give me some walk-on role hoping that i would talk about hey i'm gonna be at the ford theater this thursday night you know or i was gonna i I played the kennedy center i was the narrator for the john philip souza extravaganza on the fourth of july those those are always fun yeah those are great and and you know but acting i had to learn from scratch and boy I loved it. I just loved it. How did you get yourself immersed in it? Uh, well, I first of all, I asked. I asked some people who were already successful, some of whom I had on my show, and um, I said, where did you study? How did you figure out how the business works? And I gave myself plenty of time to figure out how the business works. I tend to talk about the Abraham Lincoln method. You know, he once famously said, if I had an hour to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first 45 minutes sharpening the ax. So that's what I did. I I do that all the time in my life. I study what works, what doesn't work, who are the gatekeepers, who can say yes, who can say no, who has the power, you know, what do you need to do to be successful? And I really took the time to study. I interned at casting offices. I interned at agents' offices, one-man band agents, big agencies. Uh, I interned in writers' rooms. I interned at a network. You just walked in and said, I will do this for nothing. You need some help. Well, they all have intern programs that you can, you know. Um, I I went to all kinds of casting workshops uh, to learn not to be cast. In fact, I didn't even try, like... There are times when I wouldn't give my headshot because I'm like, I'm not ready to audition. I'm not looking. I'm not looking to get, you know, brought in for something. I just want to learn from you. How do you run your office? What does this all work? So that's the kind of person that I am. And I took four good years, and I did a play, and I think I'm the only actor in Los Angeles that's ever gotten his agent from doing what's called black box theater. It's the little tiny forty nine seat theaters. Right. Nobody else has ever gotten an agent. I did. I don't know how. I was doing a play called Bukowskical, which was about Charles Bukowski, and it was a comedy about Charles Bukowski. Sounds like somebody I was in a fraternity with. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then some agent, you know, was brought there by his his clients. Celebrities started coming to this thing. And he waited for me out in front of the Sacred Fools Theater here in Los Angeles. And he said, do you have an agent? And I'm like, I'm I'm not ready. for. I'm still training. I'm not ready for an agent. And he goes, oh, yes, you are. And then he, and I've been with him ever since. Wow. It's been like almost 17 years. And and he's apparently done well by you. He's, he's, he's a great guy. He he knows what he's doing. Yeah, absolutely. To want to be an actor. As I, as, I, as, I, as, as I like to say, um, yeah. it's got to be in your gallbladder. 
because you've got it's got to be who you are and when that's <laughs> why my gallbladder feels the way it does yeah. oh okay now, now yeah understand. now i understand yeah yeah i mean it's got to be who you are you have it's got to be what you want to do and nothing's going to stop you because i i've been in the casting lounges here in la and i'm like all these people i'm competing against and that's the guy they're going to hire because he looks like the person that the the role fits. You think? And then, and then two months later, you're sitting there watching TV, and a commercial comes up. Yeah, that was the guy they you'd they think for. You'd think sometimes that's the way it happens. Um, I I think that people want to be actors for uh, appropriate reasons, and sometimes some very inappropriate reasons. Like they want to be famous, bad reasons, or they want to be wealthy. Right. Yeah. Then why are they going into voiceover? I mean, you know, if there's one thing actors know, it's the taste of ramen. They understand. <laughs> and, mac and, cheese, yeah. and yeah, what? And what? And mac and cheese. And mac and cheese, exactly. Yeah. And look at me. So, you know, I, I feel like, um, yeah, I actually remember all the way back to when I was six or seven years old. The very first time I thought maybe I would, I would want to be an actor was when I watched this film called Gijo. G-I-G-O-T. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob, Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason, exactly. Is a, is a clown type figure in Paris. Not a clown, he but he was a mute. He was a deaf mute, right? And he was a, an apartment manager who was uh, very badly mistreated and was accused of of uh, molesting this little girl. Um, I mean, and no lines, right? Just that face, that face. And I think Jackie Gleason is one of the most underrated actors in the history of our business because he made me as a six or seven year old laugh and cry and wonder and why can't he talk? Not that guy isn't talking on that movie, but that apartment manager. No, he didn't do that. Why are you accusing him of doing that? He didn't do that, you know, and and. I, I just remember being affected by it and that I wanted to do that. And it happened for me with audio. It's happened for me with video. And I think you're absolutely right. I'm going to go in for some tests on my gallbladder now that I know <laughs> that this is what you think. What are they going to find in there? They're going to oh, find a little theater. That's there. right. A little, there's going to be a little lockbox, I think, you know. <laughs> Once again, we're talking with David H. Lawrence, the 17th, and we're talking about acting and as it relates to voice acting which is you know there's a lot of actors out there that you know they're screen actors some of them just have great voices and you hear them on commercials and you and you hear mm -hmm. them narrating stuff mm -hmm. and then there are some guys that they 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 try to make this transition and try and do voice acting which of course a lot of happened during the pandemic sure and they didn't get it yeah why do, why do you think that that was that some people weren't able to make that transition well, I think some people take care of all the different facets that go into your acting, your look, your movement, uh, your understanding of drama, comedy, scripting, uh, production, right? Um, and uh, then you go into voiceover and you think, how hard can this be? It's You're just talking. <laughs> yeah. You know? Right. And And they find out very quickly how hard it can be. And then... The inverse of that is true as well. I think if you look at your your absolute favorite actors, you're going to say to yourself, wow, they've got a distinctive voice. I get it. I understand. And it, and it just adds to things. You know, uh, if, a, if an actor can, if somebody can do an impression of an actor, then they've got it all going on, you know? Right. Right? And I think that we as voice actors, there are plenty of voice actors who kind of push back at the whole notion of uh, doing anything on camera, I urge you to do something on camera so that you know that you are an actor because it's too late. You're already an actor. There's no, there's, no, there's no escaping it. Even if all you do is work on mic, you're still an actor. Sorry. I hate to break it to you. Yeah. I, I have found when I, when I start working with people, and I've worked with a lot of actors who are... You know, they're like, well, I got to, now I have to do voiceover. Uh, <laughs> yeah, which, because, you know, acting sort of went by the wayside for them. But the one I try to teach them is, is that the microphone is, it's a camera. 
And the fact of the matter is, is when you're doing a scene with somebody, you're working with that other person. You are playing to them. You are not playing to the camera, unless you're like doing a depends, know, yeah, a Tide commercial. We won't mention any names, and uh, and and you have to look in the camera and 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 talk to the camera, but forget that the microphone is there, and just be present in what it is that you're doing. Yeah, I I, I have a variant on that theme. It's like you have to be aware of where you are on ca on mic, you also have to be aware of where you are on camera. There are so many things that people don't know about working on camera. So I'm now on a on a, a, a one shot. I'm I'm on a uh, what's called a cowboy shot if I was standing up. And if I'm talking to somebody on camera, my head is actually tilted toward the camera even though I'm talking to their camera side eye. And that opens my face up to the camera. If they're over there, I'm not looking that way because it changes what the camera sees. Right. And when you're on mic, the same thing can be happening depending upon what the axis of the pickup pattern is. And, right. and you ten, if, you, if you're not wearing ear, earphones, if you're not wearing earbuds or headphones, you can't hear this. But you can adjust yourself just like you can on camera and just like you can on stage. You know, you open yourself out to the audience when you're hosting or when you're working in a play. There's all of these things that actors do that hopefully nobody ever notices. And it's not just on camera actors. It's not just on stage actors. It's voice talent as well, right? So you're absolutely right, Dan, 100%. I totally agree. And I hope that that first question that really deserved an amazing answer, a satisfying one, is someday going to be answered for you. We'll get to it eventually. But we're going to get to your questions in just a minute. We're with David H. Lawrence, the 17th. Again, if you have a question, you can ask that question in the chat room in Facebook or in uh, YouTube. And we will get to those questions right after these important messages. So don't go away here on Voice Over Body Shot. Now I have to figure out where to go in here and go to the break like this. You're still watching VOBS? Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. There's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies, because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. Oh, it's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. Hey there, Hero. It's David H. Lawrence, the 17th, and I have spent the last few months updating, bringing right up to the minute all the information in my free course that's called Mastering Home-Based VoiceOver. And it begins this week. So if you want to be notified when the first free lesson drops, uh, which will be on Thursday... Uh, go to VOHeroes.com slash go. This course is a very deep dive. It's about 10 hours long, a very deep dive into the business of voiceover, the equipment you need, the uh, artwork that you need to understand, different categories of voiceover, and your mindset. And I want you to have all the preparatory information and strategies and tactics that you need. So join me for mastering home-based voiceover. Go to VOHeroes.com slash go that's voheroes.com slash go you know i used to live in buffalo new york but now i'm in sunny southern california but no matter where you are when you need equipment strictly for voiceover there's only one place to go and that's voiceoveressentials.com and right now is the time to get with Harlan Hogan's Signature Series V01A voiceover microphone. They also have the fabulous Sentrance MicPort Pro 2 with limiter in stock. 
In fact, it's the only version they sell. Now, a limiter is a must-have, especially when recording oneself with no engineer to ride gain for you. By the way, it's the most amazing limiter they've encountered. It's impossible to detect, and it's incredibly quiet. And they've upgraded the PortaBooth Pro Quick Script LED light. Now it has two goosenecks, all the better to read your script. Go on over to VoiceOver Essentials right now to get these great VoiceOver Essential products. Hi, this is Bill Farmer, and you are watching VoiceOver Body Shop. It's great. And we're back with David H. Lawrence the 17th. <laughs> Just for a moment, it's like, what was his name again? <laughs> no, I remembered your name. You look like a deer in the headlights there for a second. What What, what do you need? <laughs> what, what, what can I do for you, Dan? I'm just amazed. I got you know, the right I, shot. Did, I, did you move out here for the same reason I moved out here because of the weather on the East Coast? Uh, yeah, January and February. So. Okay, great. So, so you're you're from Cleveland. I'm from Buffalo. We're but I wasn't in Cleveland. Like you were in... I was in Washington, D.C. it's hot as hell there. Well, but not then. Oh. Okay. March... They have absolutely no idea that they're sitting on the Chesapeake Bay and they have exactly the same issue that Buffalo and Cleveland have, lake effect weather. Part. Yeah. Yeah. So I got out of there. I got the hell out. Well, we have a ton of questions. Here. Let's do it. Let's see if we can get to some of these. Uh, Vern Pringle. Hi, Vern. And YouTube question. I'm 65. That's Welcome not how to Vern, the club. That's not how Vern Pringle sounds. I know. Um... And starting out in VO, should I gravitate towards audition scripts geared more for older voices? I don't know if I should, if I should uh, do a script geared for a younger voice. Yes. Opinions? Yes. That's all for tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the number uh, here... Listen, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know what age... I mean, I know you just mentioned how old you are physically, but I have no idea how old your voice is. Uh, I will tell you that I am going to be 64 in about three weeks. 64. My voice doesn't appear to be 64 years old just yet. So I tend to uh, get auditions for 30 to late 40s, 30 years old to late 40s. And I tend to be cast in just straight ahead adult things, not older adult and so on. So without knowing what your voice qualities are, I couldn't tell you, but I would definitely say to start with whatever category you end up discerning what your voice age is and then going one up and one down. I'm sure you can make yourself sound a little bit younger, maybe sound a little bit older, but that's kind of the range that I would work on in terms of scripts. Interesting. We don't realize how old we are or how young we are. For mm -hmm. example, when I was a kid, you know, my parents would have friends over. And I'm like, who are all these old people here that are hanging out here? And then I was invited to some friend's house in Oxnard a few, a few years or a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And suddenly he's mixing cocktails and it's like, why am I hanging out with my parents' friends? And, and then suddenly I look in the yeah. mirror and I'm like, that's oh. why. <laughs> yeah, and that and when you start looking in your news feed and it's there's a lot more like, oh, I'm so sad. Sally passed away. And Sally was who you took to the junior prom. Yeah. And you're like, oh. But that's not what we're talking about here, Dan. It's not. No. But I was just relating yeah. the fact that we don't know how old we no. actually are. Yeah. But we or, actually... And the other, the, there's a dark side to that. And that's also that it wasn't dark enough. Well, okay. you, there are people, especially older uh, people who are pushing back as though it's an insult when somebody says, no, man, you don't look that age anymore. You look this age, you know, um, and they tend to be upset by that. What do you mean? I'm 65. What are you, what are you talking about? What do you mean? My, my voice sounds like I'm 70. What are you talking about? You know, yeah. or not. So, you know, we want to be sometimes what we're not. Remember when we were young, all we wanted to be was older, right? We would read up when we were tweens, we'd be like, Oh, boy's life instead of uh cub scout magazine. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm going to read that. And girls, same thing. You know, they're not teens yet, but they're reading Teen Beat. Right. Whatever. All right. Tiger Beat. Tiger Beat. Thank yeah. you. Lloyd Thaxton's Tiger Beat. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> got a steel trap memory for really stupid stuff. All right. Okay. All right. 
Let's get on to the next question. Jim Frank asks. Okay. This is actually a tech question, which mm-hmm. I can probably answer. All right. Uh, I says, um, what's a good interface? I have $500 to spend. Wow. Well, you have about $300 to spare there to spend on something else. Yeah, you don't <laughs> believe me. You, you absolutely have a budget that I don't know who set your budget, but become <laughs> friendly with that person for the rest of your life because you can skim off the top. Yeah, go for it. Exactly. I just happen to have one of these guys sitting around. Uh, you know, here's a, a Focusrite 2i2, 150 bucks, and it will do everything you need it to do. Yeah. And it doesn't sound any better or any worse than something that is $500 more. Yeah. So I think people get caught up on the idea of features and stuff that will make you sound, that can try and enhance your sound. Or they figure spending more money. Again, this is this is a very interesting position. Yeah. Price versus value, right? Right. This is a great example of if you have five hundred dollars to spend on an interface. Well, sure. If I spend four ninety nine on a really expensive interface, it's going to sound better than the one hundred fifty dollar interface, isn't it? No. Uh, price and value aren't necessarily locked, but our impressions of them are. Right. Yeah, that's a really important part. Yeah. 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 I have found there is no interface and no microphone out there that will change the way you read copy or perform copy. Right. Yet people are like, I got to have a U87. No, you don't. You yeah. don't need one of those. It's not going to make you a better voice actor. What's going to make you a better voice actor is taking that extra $300 and taking a couple of voice acting lessons. That would be or, that'd perhaps be great. even with or, like, VOHeroes.com. Or just the free course that I have starting this Thursday as we're recording this, which is Monday. Right. Um, Thursday, the 25th of August, I'm uh, doing a course called Mastering Home-Based VoiceOver. It's absolutely free. Uh, it will uh, take you through what I consider to be the four keys of VoiceOver, including the performance of the different categories of voice work. And so... Um, if you go to VOHeroes.com slash go, I'll let you know on Thursday when the uh, first lesson drops. But again, it's absolutely free. It'll be across nine days. I've been working on it for a couple months now. And yeah, Mr. Frank, you don't have to spend that extra $300. We could go to like Morton's or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or Can- Cantor's. Or- oh, Yeah. Went to the deli exhibit at the Skirball. It actually was very interesting. <laughs> the deli exhibit. They're now having exhibits about delis. It was Okay. All right. Okay. And, and, they show and, you how they corn the beef? No, it was more of the history of the ah, delicatessen. I gotcha. All right. All right. Terry Briscoe asks, uh, how do you harness that same energy when there is no one in to, to interact with when you're acting because it's just you and your mic? Yep, it's just you and your mic, and it's just you and your camera when you're auditioning for television, and it's just you and the casting director. If you go someplace to do that, you don't have an audience, you don't have a crew, you don't have a director or an engineer like you might be if you were going to a studio. And it's all about paying attention to two things. Who are you talking to, and what are you trying to help them get done? They have a job. The job may be getting their clothes clean. The job may be getting a new car. The job may be, this we're talking commercials here, the job may be uh, serving their family. But there are higher goals with all of this. You don't want to just serve your family a nice hot meal. You want your family to love you. You want your family to rely on you, to have confidence in you, that you know you're taking care of them. So who are you talking to? Are you talking to that mom or that kid or that coworker or whatever? And once you do that, once you determine who it is that you're talking to, then you simply go about the notion of helping them get their job done, whatever that job is. And the script will tell you. Now, if you need outside influence... I think usually what I ask my clients to do is to reconsider that. Just reconsider that for just a moment and think, how do I think to myself without outside influence? How do I determine what I'm going to do with the day or the week or your life without somebody, you know, leading me down some path, right? So there's all kinds of really easy ways to generate internal energy when you're doing this sort of thing. And that's what I do. All right. 
Yeah. Next question we have is, let's see, Terry had a second part. He says, had to become, had come to the realization that voiceover is acting. Duh. Hey, uh, be and, nice. And, uh, it's my audience. I can All say right, what do I whatever you want. Uh, I don't want to be labeled as an actor when I first started because I don't want to be misleading. After doing both, I now realize that both are acting and they just have I have different methods. Yeah. I or, think that's or do they? No, nah, I think that's an inculcation of the uh imposter syndrome. You think to yourself, well, I'm just starting off. I'm not an actor yet. No, no, sorry. The moment the moment you begin in any any part of this business, too late. You're an actor. Now, are you an accomplished actor? Are you a veteran actor? Are you a union actor? Are you an actor with credits? Man, maybe not. But you're an actor. And if you would celebrate that, enjoy that, internalize that, feed on that. Excellent. Max Goldberg asks uh, on YouTube, by the way. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Um, Smash that like button, Max. Uh, absolutely. What steps does David take when evaluating a script before recording an audition? That's a great question. Uh, it's, it's kind of a variation on the theme. Who am I talking to? What kind of job am I trying to help them get done? And it, and it covers all categories of voice work, all categories of voice work. Um, cold reading, self-direction, these are things that require that you trust the writer. And the problem is some of us come from radio. <laughs> and <laughs> there... Yeah. Often the writer is a salesperson who's working from a formula, part of which includes repeating the phone number 15 times at the end of the spot. Right. And which nobody ever pays attention to. Uh, I, yeah. I, well, it, dep it depends if they need what you're offering them. Right. right? That's true. Yeah. And, and that's a self-selecting group of people. If you're not in the market for detergent, the best detergent spot in the world is not going to sell you detergent. It may make you laugh. It may make you go, oh, that's interesting. But if you need detergent, oh, that becomes the most important thing in your life at that very moment, right? Think about when you need a product and you go searching for it on Amazon. All of a sudden, you know, that's what I need. So the words to me always should be given the, the heft of doing the heavy lifting. So as I look at a script, it is have faith in the writer, admire what they've done, look for what their goal was, what are they trying to get accomplished, what do they want you, how do you fit into the story, because sometimes you're a number of different uh, actors doing the same thing, you know, how do you fit in in the story, and then do your best to really carefully identify who you're talking to, and it's never all of you people in the broadcast studio audience, it's never that. <laughs> It's one person. Arthur Godfrey changed everything. Long before Phil or, or uh, Paul Harvey changed things, Arthur Godfrey was complained about to Congress because instead of the typical broadcast um, announcery, and now let's talk about Tetley Tea. For those of you sitting in your kitchens all across America, wait, here's how to... No. Arthur Godfrey was... He was Hawaii, Hawaii. That's he was... He there, was yeah. Listen, I know exactly how you feel. You got your, your husband off to work. You got your kids off to school. It's not even 9.30 in the morning, and you're exhausted. Am I right? Yeah, you're... Well. I'm not asking you if I'm right about Arthur Godfrey. Wait, That's what he would that? sure. he would say. Am I right? And and you could just feel housewives across America going, "Oh my God, yes!" And and then the next thing he would say, up on your shelf, it's the third shelf up on the right. That's where the Tetley Tea is. Go check it out. Or Lipton Tea. He was the Lipton Tea guy because the Tetley Tea Company complained to Congress. That Arthur Godfrey was hypnotizing America's housewives. No, he was just talking to them the way they wanted to be talked to. He was talking to them the way, yeah. You know, we, we think there's this massive audience, millions of people, but they're listening one at a time. They're not sitting in a stadium somewhere engaging in this in a group 
thing kind of thing, right? All right. So anyway, that's why, that's how I approach it. I hope that's helpful. Right. It's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Absolutely. You are not talking to a million people. You're talking to one person sitting in a car somewhere going, okay. Yeah. And that's video. not even the person you're talking to. Right. You have an archetype. That's who you're talking to. And that person identifies with that archetype. So. All righty. All right. Next question is... I love these questions. These questions are great. Can we stay on until 9 o'clock tonight? We, we can. Oof. i got to eat dinner eventually. All right. Uh, let's see. Jonathan Grant. Hi, David. Can you offer some tips and tricks to transition from a linear mindset to the more abstract, creative mindset required for consistent, authentic reads for nerdy, recovering programmers? Wow, have you told yourselves a bunch of bull. <laughs> what? Yeah. Where, what? Okay, first of all, I have a very linear mind. I I am a right-brained person trapped in a left-brained body. I love step-by-step. -step. There are two types of people in the world. Here we go. Okay. Two types of people in the world. There are options people and there are process people. And you're probably a process person because you framed this question in a way that you think I'm going to answer it, but I'm about to do something called reframing. Watch this. Oh, NLP. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So options people, most artists have some, and we're all on the spectrum between options and processes, but I am way toward processes. You good? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, process people, uh, options people want to know what palette can they draw from? What kind of colors do we have? All the different things that they might be able to use to solve the problem. I want to know what all my options are. Maybe I'll decide at that point what I want to use, but I want to know even more. Process people, you give me step one through step 10 to go from I know nothing, I know bupkis, to I'm a world-class expert. Here's what you do step one, step two, step three, step four. And if you're a programmer, you're very aware of this. Now, if you're an object-oriented programmer, you may have expanded beyond that, where things are kind of waiting to be used, not necessarily being done in a step-by-step -step order. And the funny thing is, is that storytelling is still a step-by-step -step process. There's a reason why pick-your-own-endings are not very popular with audiences. Audiences don't want to be... Uh, given that burden of trying to decide what the story should, they want to be washed with the, the colors and the decisions that the writers have made. Same thing with a voice talent. You want to go from the person that you're trying to help with the whatever job, remember we talked about that, or the person that you've identified as the person you're talking to. You want to get them from not being able to do their job to having done their job, which is purchasing that product or service, or crying because the hero died, or whatever it is that you're trying to do to help them do their job, don't lose that linear thought process from the introduction to the hero's journey, to the side trips, to the sequel, to all that. This is still a linear process. Don't tell yourself that you're doing something wrong, because you're not. Okay, so there's your hall pass. I hope that helps. <laughs> that, that worked for me. All righty. Well, thanks, everyone, for your questions. An hour just goes by. That's it? We're done? Almost. All right. Not, not quite. All right. We still have to take a break. Okay. And then we'll come back, and then we'll say goodbye, and then you get to read some of the stuff that I read every week. Oh. If you can see it from here. I can't see anything. I'll bring, I'll bring it closer to All right. You. All right. David H. Lawrence. We'll be right back and finish things up right after these very important messages. So don't go away. This is Ariana Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, VoiceActorWebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact VoiceActorWebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. 
Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you know what. No, we got to go to a two shot because you and I have to talk about Source Connect. Ah. Because Source Connect is that software that allows you to talk to another studio, a big professional studio, without actually having to go to that studio. This is technology that's been around for. 15 years, I mean, it's been around for a long time. But over the internet, Source Connect by Source Elements is what you need in order to get yourself into those studios. And a lot of agencies have been saying, you got to have the paid Source Connect if you want to get voice work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I have, I have it. I know, I don't know if you have it. Do you have it? I use Source Connect now. Okay. Source Connect now. It's a free version of, uh, of Source Connect. So you can learn how to use it, and when an agent calls you and says, you got booked this spot, but you got to have Source Connect, the paid version, you can have the paid version. And now they have all sorts of different ways you can get it. You can buy it monthly. You can buy it by the time you want to use it. All these cool things, so they understand as a voice actor, you have to be flexible. And that's one of the great things about Source Connect, is it allows you to use it when you need it. And you can get a free trial of it, learn how to use it, get it all set up properly, and they have really great customer support to make sure that it all works really, really well. Where do you go for that, Dan? You go over to SourceElements.com or SourceConnect.com, and wow. you can try it there, look at the different th packages they have. It's important stuff to have, and it certainly is important stuff to know about. So go over there and check it out, Source Connect. Anyway. That's going to do it for this week, believe it or don't. Uh, but we do have to thank a bunch of people. All right. Uh, for example, we have to like thank to thank them. the Academy. Uh, well, eventually, when when we get nominated for something, which never seems to happen for some reason. But we have to thank our donors of the week. So okay. We can read these in in you know one at a time. Like uh, nine forty nine designs. Wait, wait. Right I here. Oh. In green. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Grant. Casey Clack. Christopher Epperson, Sarah Borges, Philip Sapir. Sapir, Tom Pinto, Tom Pinto, Tom Pinto, really, uh, Shelley Avellino, Brian is that, Page, is that right? That's Shelley uh, Avellino, uh, Patty Gibbons, Rob Ryder, Rob Ryder, wait, there's more, wait, Greg Thomas, a doctor voice, Antland Productions, isn't that Uncle Roy? That is Uncle Roy. Okay. Right. Shanna Pennington Baird, Martha Kahn, Don Griffith, Trey Mosley, Diana Birdsall, and Sandra Manwiller. Oh, Sandra, thank you. Oh, we, we have supporters all over the world. That's lovely. Even in Canada. How'd I do with that? Uh, you did okay. Yeah, what, I was trying to help somebody get their job done. Exactly. You know. <laughs> right. uh, we also need to thank our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials, VoiceOver Extra, Source Elements, VOHeroes.com. Oh, that's, that's you. I'm familiar. Yes. Uh, VoiceActorWebsites.com, JMC Demos, and World Voices Organization, the Industry Association of Freelance Voice Talent. Whoa, whoa. That's right. Uh, thanks to Jeff Holman for getting all the uh, the questions in there. Made the hour go by just like that. Uh, Sue Merlino, feel better, please. Don't die on me. I need and, of course, Lee Penny for simply being Lee Penny. Well, this is not an easy business. VoiceOver is a very complex you know, there's a lot of things you got to learn. It's about acting. It's about performance. It's about technology. It's about business and marketing and all those things. And we're here to tell you all about these things. Hopefully, George will be back from England one of these days, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll get back to it. But I want to thank you, David, for thank you. joining me tonight. And, wow, and, and co you're working on making sure that he comes back. That's good. Yeah. Well, you know. Can't do Tech Talk this week without him. I see. So we'll try and get it done next week or the week after, or we will make sure that you will get Tech Talk next week. In the meantime, I'm Dan Leonard. I'm David H. Lawrence, the 17th. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. Have a great week, everybody.